Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Emily, for this wonderfully warm uh, introduction. I'm a big fan of what you do, and um, nothing makes me happier than when I see young people that find a passion and go for it and just do it, so that gets my support. So I'm Tina Roth Eisenberg, <clears throat> uh, but most of you probably know me as Swiss Miss, which is my Twitter handle and um, the name of my design blog. And I believe in side projects and eccentric ants. So I want to start with the eccentric ant part. This is my uh, slightly crazy eccentric ant, Hoogie. Um, her real name is Edith. And, um, She's been a huge catalyst uh, of my inspiration as a kid. She, I think she's pretty much the reason why I'm standing here today. She's one of the reasons why I embraced or to even had the idea of becoming a designer. She, she was a fashion designer by trade and just overall creative, outgoing uh, person. And she was really not your typical Swiss aunt, as you can tell here. <clears throat> And she, she really sort of introduced me to the, to the idea that you can make a living being a designer, which is not necessarily a given. Um, the way I grew up, I, I grew up with uh, entrepreneurial parents, but it wasn't in the creative field. So I really am thankful that she kind of opened the eyes to me to the, this life path of being a creative person. And I really think that she's one of the key people why I'm here today and why I became <clears throat> what I am, a designer, a design ambassador, and someone who really loves to uh, uh, foster communities in the, in the creative uh, industry. But I'm also um, a mother, a wife, um, and this is my husband, G, and uh, my son, Tilo, and my daughter, Ella. My son is two, my daughter is six, and my wonderful husband is right now at home taking care of them, so he deserves a high five for that. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I bring this up is because um, many of you are probably just in the beginning of your careers, and you might not have a family yet, and um, what I always hear from fellow women is that they say, I don't think I can have a career and kids. Um, I have to choose, and I, I always want to make the point, and like, I think I can, I'm the living proof that you can have both. In fact, I feel that once I had kids, I really sat down and thought about what, um, where I am in my life, and my kids have really been the catalyst of my, of my career. Like, um, just to give an example, when, when, my, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I really revalued where I was in my career and said, you know, I've always wanted to have a design studio. And I was always waiting for this right moment to start it. And I can tell you one thing, the right moment is never there. The right moment is now. When you have a desire to do something, do everything in the world you can to make it happen. And I really wish I would have started my design studio earlier, but I started it the day my daughter was born, which is not something I would recommend, but, um, but I was very lucky it worked out. Um, so, <clears throat> Having kids really has pushed me forward and had, has really made me make the decisions that, that I should have done earlier and pushed my career forward. And having kids also really makes you think about who am I and where did I come from and how did I become the person that I am today? And especially in moments like this where my son has one of his super epic meltdowns, which by the way are silent, but I really stand there and I, and I photograph them and I document them on a blog. It's heartbeing2.tumblr.com. And it's been hand down to my most uh, successful Tumblr ever, which is really funny. Um, so, but in these moments where my son is having one of his epic meltdowns, I really stand there and I think, whoa, I know I was like this. And how in the world did I come from being a, a two-year-old on the floor, not being able to deal with your emotions, to be standing here on stage and being really, really happy with where my life has taken me and um, with the choices I have made. Which brings me to a quote I really love by... Martin Berman, in which he says, we define ourselves by the choices we have made. We're in fact the sum of our total choices. Which it's just a beautiful quote, and it's very deep, but it's also really scary when you're a parent, because it really shows that I have to do everything in the world I can to teach my kids, to give them the ability to make really, really smart choices. And also we have to be aware of that, that every choice we make, everything you say yes or no to, will lead you into, into becoming who you are even more. Um, so <clears throat> as I became a parent, I was really thinking about what can I teach my children to make good choices? What are the rules I live by that I think have shaped me, have shaped my life? And so I came up with an eight rules I live by that I think even though I'm speaking here as a parent and talking about parenting, 
um, and maybe many of you don't have kids yet, I think these rules can apply to anyone and anyone can pick something out of it. So I want to tell you, I want to share with you my eight rules I live by. So the first one is uh, find what you love and don't give up until you find it. And it sounds very trivial, but I, and some of you might probably agree, it's not trivial at all. And I think it gets harder and harder as our opportunities open up more and more, uh, being, uh, you know, this young generation and the world wide web at our fingertips. And <clears throat> I'm just really frightened at the time when I see, I have some friends who are in really, really dull, uninspiring jobs, and they, they admit it. And they admit that they've given up searching for what makes them happy, for whatever reason. You know, it's not always happy to when you have, it's not always easy when you're, you know, you have a mortgage and whatever, and, and to like all of a sudden say, I want to switch my careers. But I do believe that life is way too short to be stuck in something that you, that you don't love. You will never be fulfilled and you will never get out in the morning, get out of bed in the morning, like completely excited to embrace what the day brings. And I am very lucky and I'm very grateful that I have found the passion that I knew that I wanted to be in the creative and design industry very early on. And not everyone, not everyone has that luxury, but I will do everything in the world I can to help my kids find what that thing is that will make them happy. Because I think if, if you find your passion, if you know that one thing that gets you excited in the morning and you, you tailor your career around it, your life will be just, as some people say, you're in the flow right? And things will fall into place. I truly, truly believe that if you, if you do the thing you're supposed to do, things fall into place. And if something just doesn't work out and you try and try and try, then maybe steer left or steer right. So I'm going to really teach my children that they can settle for not, they cannot settle for anything less than that, something that they really, really love. And I must say, a few weeks ago, I walked my daughter to school, uh, my six-year-old, and we're skipping down the street, and usually my husband walks out to school. And I said, Ella, I really, really love walking you to school. And she stopped, and she looked at me, and she goes, you really love walking me to school, mommy? I go, yeah. And she goes, do you like your job? And oh my god, I, this is like the fact that she even asks me this made my heart jump. And on the corner of President and Hoyt Street, I gave her, uh, on, on, on the Pacific and Hoyt Street, I gave her the biggest talk ever. Like I stood there and I gave like, oh my God, can I just tell you how much I love my job? I love my job so much that I can't wait to get out of my bed in the morning. And in fact, I don't even look at it as my job. I don't look at my job as work. I look at my job as just an extension of who I am. And I can't wait to go into my office and continue doing the things I love. And she stood there with like big eyes and she could tell like she asked some magic question. And then, and then we continue walking and she goes, so what do you like better, walking me to school or going to work? <laughs> So this brings me to a quote by uh, <clears throat> Paul Graham in an essay um, titled, Do What You Love. He said, to be happy, you have to do something you not only enjoy but admire. You have to be able to say at the end, wow, that's pretty cool. And I'm very, very lucky that I can do that every single day. <clears throat> and in fact, I agree with him that he says, you have to like your work more than any unproductive pleasure. In fact, the concept of spare time should be mistaken. But at the same time, as, as um, I'm trying to teach my kids or try to like, you know, um, help the, you, some of my people that work with me that are younger, like just help finding them what, what really makes them happy, what I also want to teach my kids and people that surround me that I can inspire in someone is that you have to stay open-minded. Because this is a quote by Dan Gilbert, he says, there's one thing we have to keep in mind. The reason that most of us are unhappy most of the time is that we set our goals not for the person we're going to be when we reach them. We set our goals for the person we are when we set them. And that's exactly what happened to me. So I knew I wanted to be in the design industry. I, I studied graphic design. I started working in, in, in design studios in New York, always thinking that one day I will have my own design studio and I will be so happy. That's like, that was like my ultimate goal. And then I started my design studio when my daughter was born and right off the bat I had super prestigious clients, way more clients that I could handle, and everything was going amazing. And then about two years in, I really started noticing, you know what? I do love design, I do love graphic design, but I actually don't like the setup of a studio of solving someone else's problems. I realized that I, I in fact, was not happy, even though everything looked like it was just perfect. 
So I sat down and I started thinking about, well, what is it that makes me happy? I knew it was the design industry, but it was not running a studio. <clears throat> so I started really thinking about it and I realized, wow, the things that make me happy are actually the things that I started doing on the side. So my blog, which I started in 2005, uh, on which I just uh, share, uh, it's like my personal visual archive where I sh share things that delight me that I think are well designed, that are humorous, it's just like things I come across that I want to share with the world. There was Studio Mates. Uh, we'll talk about this a bit later, but <clears throat> I created sort of the ideal workspace for me where I'm surrounded with, with incredibly smart and talented creative people. Then there was a Creative Mornings, which I started in 2008, a breakfast lecture series, which I started out of like sort of a conference fatigue. And there was a, a to-do app that I created because I couldn't find a to-do app that worked for me called To-Do. And so I'm sitting there thinking, wow, wait a second, all of these side projects, these passion projects that I worked on are actually the things that make me really, really happy. Uh, and it wasn't my design studio. And then I, I thought about it, it's like, wait a second, all of these, these projects actually started, uh, all of, most all of them, uh, started generating um, some income. So some people call me the queen of accidental businesses. And, <clears throat> And this very deep thinking about where I am and what am I doing actually started again when I was pregnant with my second kid, with my son. Again, I said, as I said, like the, my kids have really been my, the catalyst in, in like pushing me forward. And as I, um, as I got more and more pregnant with my son, I realized, you know, this, I need to go on a client sabbatical. I need to just try this. So I sat down with my husband, who's incredibly supportive, and said, um, gee, I think I can still cover my portion of how we divide, out, divide up our cost. What would you say if I go on a one-year client sabbatical after our son is born and, <clears throat> and just try to see what, comes, what I can do, what I can come up with um, besides you know, having clients? Maybe there's something else. You know, I, just, I just believe deep inside that there, there's more I can do. And he was very supportive and he said, um, absolutely go for it. So this brings me to number two. <clears throat> So when I started my design, uh, my, uh, my sabbatical, I kind of followed one of my biggest rules, and this is don't be a complainer. You gotta make things, pr uh, you gotta make things better. Complaining just doesn't bring you anywhere. Uh, and I wanna raise my kids to be problem solvers. Like every day when they complain, I go instantly into how can you, how can you solve it? You know, what's the solution? And my favorite thing is that my, my husband is the, the king of hacks. Like he's really handy. So when my daughter for the first time when she was like four said, like mommy, let's make a hack. I was like, yes, this is the great thinking that we want to inspire. So um, in 2010, my daughter came home from her birthday party and um, brought these really ugly temporary tattoos in her goodie bag and she asked me to apply them. And they were really not up to par with my Swiss aesthetic, let's put it that way. And <clears throat> as I'm standing there applying them, and I'm grumbling and complaining, I caught myself also with a personal rule is that if you, keep your, if you catch yourself complaining about the same thing, either let it go and be done with it or do something about it. So I looked at myself and I was like, well, I am so gonna do something about this. So I re researched what it takes to make temporary tattoos. I reached out to some of my designer friends and said, hey, what would you say if I make a cool site uh, and you would supply me with some designs for temporary tattoos? And I had no idea how uh, incredibly exciting it is for an illustrator or an artist to uh, design for skin. It's like an entirely new canvas. So the next day I had designs in my inbox by, from Jessica Hish and like you, know, you named the big names in the illustrator world, illustrator world. And I was like, wow, I'm onto something. So a month and a half later, we launched Hatley. And oh my God, the world has been waiting for temporary tattoos. I had no idea. So, <clears throat> so we launched and I blogged about it in Swiss Miss. And it was like this magic thing. I, I can't even tell you how much I love the internet. But instantly, you know, we sat there, we launched. It was like, let's see if orders come in. And instantly, orders kept coming in. And, and we got such an incredible press coverage, coverage. It was amazing. And I knew right then, the next day, when I got a call from a very, very prestigious art <laughs> museum in London, they called and said, could we have a wholesale catalog? And I took her address, I hung up the phone, I turned around and said, okay guys, what, what exactly is a wholesale catalog? What? So we, <clears throat> we instantly started working on the, uh, on, um, on the packaging and, and took everything a little more seriously. And this is, this is three of my team uh, demonstrating like 250 of our designs. We have like now, we launched a year and a half ago, we have almost 300 designs at this point. This is the packaging. 
one of our packagings. Uh, these are some of our designs. So we have shipped to over um, 90 countries. Some of them I can't even pronounce, to be honest. Uh, we've won the Shopify competition. We've had press in every like magazine you can think of. We are in over 300 stores around the world. We're in Urban Outfitters now. We're in Land of Nod. And it's just been absolutely amazing. And best of all, I have the most amazing team of seven people that are all really young. They're all between, I would say, 23 and 26. And they basically run Tatley. And it has been the most satisfying project I have ever started. And, and also because uh, this. If you go to our artist page and look who has been making Tatley, designing Tatley for us, they're all really well-established designers and illustrators that I finally found a way to collaborate with. But not only to collaborate with, but also to um, create a passive income generator. I'm a firm believer that if, you, if you're a creative person, um, your goal needs to be to create, a, create passive income. Because if you have passive income coming in, you can continue working on other things. So um, what I've, I kind of have this, um, this passion for challenging status quo, so how things are done. And I've also done it here with how we, um, how we uh, pay our illustrators. Because usually when you, do, when you look at the licensing world, I find it is, it's kind of broken. I've, I have a lot of illustrator friends. And they would always tell me, you know, like a big giant corporation pays them, I don't know, 3,000 for a design. Then they turn around and sell, I don't know, millions and millions of bet spreads with their design on it. And, and that's it. The only cut they got was like the 3,000. That's not fair. So what I've done is like um, our designers get a cut of every, and a very generous cut of every single Tatley sale. So the better their Tatley does, the more money they get. And every three months when we pay the, the artist, pay, artist payments, we get emails of all caps and lots of um, exclamation points because they just can't believe that we've, we've created this like, um, ongoing passive income for them. And it makes me super happy. <clears throat> so all in all, this, this, this Tatley project is, I think, for anyone, a perfect example that you need to take your side project seriously. I honestly launched this more as a joke than anything else. And it has now become one of my biggest businesses. As I said, I have seven people work full time. And it has been unbelievable. And it's, this leads me to my all time favorite quote. It's by James Murphy. It says, the best way to complain is to make things. So don't just complain. If, if something bugs you, make it better or let it go. <clears throat> Let's go on to number three. So I'm a big believer in trusting your intuition. There's moments. Like, for example, Nate Silver showed us during this election where I think data crunching totally makes sense. But there's also moments where I feel like we have started relying too much on, on, on numbers and we really don't listen to our gut anymore. And what I find so fascinating is that uh, one half of all of our nerve cells are actually in our gut. And as many neurotransmitters as you have in your brain, you also have in your gut. So I, I, I will definitely teach my children to listen to what their intuition says, tells them. Like um, Einstein said, I believe in intuitions and in inspirations. I sometimes feel that I'm right. I do not know that I am. So that's something I want to teach my children. But at the same time, I realize I might, I might be setting myself up because this is kind of what I did with uh, my parents when on uh, September 11th, 2000, 2001, I worked just a few blocks away from the towers and I was one of the people walking home covered in ash. I lost my job, the studio, like we couldn't go back in for three weeks, they shut down, and <clears throat> all the signs were, were basically pointing to, Tina, you need to go back to Europe. And my parents, of course, were completely freaked out, you know, like, I mean, it was, it was a scary time. And all I kept telling them is like, mom, dad, just please trust me, I know in my gut, I just know my, intu my intuition tells me my New York chapter is not over. I cannot close this book and put it up on the shelf and come back to Switzerland. And I, and it, it was torturous for my parents, but they now see what I was feeling. And um, a year later, I landed an amazing job at a company called Plum Design, which is now called ThinkMap. Isn't that funny, those old monitors? Um, <clears throat> and I was part of the blue team, and that, that job really has then um, started my career and really boosted it. I, I worked on things like the visual thesaurus and it was an absolutely fantastic job with an incredible work environment, smart people. And it was there where I was invited to speak at my very first conference. And I remember when I got that um, invitation to speak at AIGA Seattle and I opened that email, I read it, and I nearly peed in my pants when I saw that John Maeda was the keynote speaker. 
And I instantly closed and said, there's no way I can do this. No, I won't do this. Which leads me to number four. If an opportunity scares you, you need to take it. Because if you're really, really honest with, your th with yourself, you're scared because you're afraid of failing. And that little thing that scares you is going to make you grow so much by doing it. So um, <clears throat> I thought about it a little bit and then realized that I'm just afraid. And I agreed on doing it. And I have never in my life prepared for anything like that talk <laughs> um, before. And I, um, this was, again, this was the first time speaking ever in front of an audience. And <clears throat> my husband saw how much I uh, prepared. And we, he traveled with me to Seattle. And we went out there. And John Maeda spoke. And then four speakers in. It was me. Look at me. It's very meta. <clears throat> and I think the talk went OK. And after it was done, I had this rush that I think um, marathon runners must have after they're done with a with run. I wouldn't know that. But um, I was done after my talk, and I walked back up to my husband was kind of sitting in the back. And because he knew how much I prepared, how much I admired John Maeda, how much this just meant to me. And <clears throat> I walked back up towards him. And, and as I get closer, he's like, He's like weird. He keeps doing this. Like, turn around. I was like, what? Weird. So I turn around, and John Maeda is chasing me. And in his very John Maeda way, he stands in front of me and he goes, that was very inspiring. Thank you so much. He turns around, walks away, and I think that's the last thing I remember of that day. I nearly fainted. <laughs> my, my husband was equally speechless. And it sort of did, that was kind of the icing on the cake, you know? Like just getting his blessing um, and I was so afraid, and I was so close to saying no. That just really reinforced this rule. If you're afraid of something, really think about it, why you're afraid of it, and just try to, just try to go for it. There's nothing you can lose. This brings me to um, my rule number five. There's nothing more important than finding like-minded people. Or as Seth Godin says, that you have to find your tribe. Um, so. I was very lucky in that I was able to uh, go to, to attend conferences either as speaker or a lot of times as press for my blog, Swissmas. And I noticed after attending several, several conferences that there's something wrong about the conference world. Because everybody, what everybody wants is just like meeting people, right? And, and conferences are expes expensive. A lot of young people can't afford it to go. And I wanted to do something about it. And also they're kind of like these these like the big conferences there, like people fly in from all around the world and there's these like communities that happen for two days and then they, poof, they evaporate. So I thought about this and I started a lecture series called Creative Mornings in 2008 here in New York in my studio. Everyone laughed at me and said, first of all, people will not show up in the morning. This is New York. And, and also you will never find sponsors to cover this so I can keep it free. And, and I, sh I proved everyone wrong. And to be honest, I never, ever thought it would turn into what it turned um, today, which is um, we're over in over 40 cities now. We are in six, six continents. Um, after I started running here in New York, like, if, like maybe a year in, all of a sudden my friend who moved to LA said, come on, let me open one in LA. And then there's a friend in Zurich, and then there's a friend in San Francisco. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I have like applications after applications coming in. And it really, it really caught on fire, and we realized that Meeting up with, with a creative community in your city that you can see on a regular basis, re there's really a need for that. And making it accessible for everyone, they're free. So if you want to attend one, if you have never heard of it, <clears throat> you should try to attend next week's, next week's Creative Mornings, which is going to be hosted at the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum. It's with George Lewis. Um, the way it works is it's a Monday morning at 11 a.m. before that, that Friday's um, event, the RSVP list opens. So. Go to creativemornings.com and click on the New York chapter, which takes you to the Eventbrite, and set your alarms. If you have any interest in coming, it's, it's really going to be an amazing event. Um, set your alarm for 11 a.m. on Monday morning, this Monday morning. Um, because at 11 a.m., the RSVP opens up, and sometimes it sells out within five minutes. So you got to be on it. If you do not get a ticket, then uh, put yourself on the wait list. And uh, there's, a, there's a chance you might get in after all. So <clears throat> creative mornings happen once a month on Friday mornings. They're free. There's free breakfast. There's a 20-minute talk. And then you go off to work afterwards at, uh, at 10 o'clock. What is really amazing is that I want to show you some pictures from around the world. This is Zurich. This was at the Fright Tech factory, the Fright the bags, the truck tarp bags. Um, this is in LA. This is in San Francisco. 
and this is in a fairly new chapter in Utrecht in Europe. What, what Creative Mornings really has, has shown is that real connections are made in, in, in person and not behind a screen. And I think the more digital this world gets, the more this like in-person meeting, the more important that becomes and people start realizing it. And I must say the hosts that run Creative Mornings are an extraordinary group of people. In every city, there's someone that runs it. So in New York, it's me that runs it, but, but then these are all people that applied from all around the world, and everyone works for free, everyone volunteers. And it's, it's this type of person that sees the value in organizing something like this and giving back to a community that I feel like needs to support, we need to support. <clears throat> and it makes me un unbelievably happy. It's a group of idealists that, that just, I, I can't even tell you how grateful I am for them. So creativemornings.com if you want to find out um, more about the organization and also we have once a year we we allow the audience to speak so if any one of you has aspirations to become a speaker or wants to give it a shot and has something interesting to share if you go to creativemornings.com and slash I want to speak you can apply for to be an eight, eight minute speaker for December All right and this brings me to one of a uh, quote by Clay Shirky we systematically overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other which is obviously proven by something like Creative Mornings. And also brings me to my first few months as working on my own design studio, which I did out of this really teeny tiny home office. And after just a few weeks, I realized this is not happening. I mean, how much can you talk to a fridge? And even though you're connected to like, you know, via Skype and whatever, you can be connected to a lot of creative people. It's not the same when it's not face to face. So I decided to get a space. I had this vision of my ideal workspace, and I created it. I found a space in Dumbo, Brooklyn. We're right on the East River. And what started out to be like a, a space for four people has now grown into a 30-people um, collaborative workspace. We kept breaking, breaking through walls left and right. And boy, can I tell you, like going to work, not just because I love what I do, I love, it. I love so much going to my studio because of the people that I'm surrounded with. We're all independent designers, illustrators, developers, copywriters, and <clears throat> we all had this vision that if you surround yourself by people that are driven and entrepreneurial and smart and respectful, you, you get better at anything you do. You just get, if, you, if you're surrounded by smart people, you get smarter. If you're surrounded by people that have really, really high uh, standards in the work they put out, your work gets better. And this space has been, it, I call it my happy place. And <clears throat> while there are a lot of co-working spaces, I think Studio Mate sets itself apart a little bit in that it's a very communally driven one. Like we all are a, a, like a big group of friends. And we hang out together and we play rock band together. And it's just, I'm extremely blessed to have Studio Mates. And, and for example, this is on the front left, that's Cameron, it was his birthday. And he always wears plaid shirts, jeans, and flip-flops, and has a field note in his shirt. So as a surprise, we all dressed in his uniform. And he walked in that morning, like we're all sitting at our desks, and it took him about three, four minutes to go like, wait a second. So, and also because he has like his own like meat diet, we made him a meat cake with spinach. Um, <clears throat> so we have a lot of fun, but we also produce a lot of really good stuff. And it's, it's amazing um, that we actually were on the radar of the New York Times and they wrote a, a really long article about us, which of course made us happy. So if you go to studiomates.com, you can see who's in our space and you will recognize a lot of the names. Let's go on to number six. So this brings me perfectly into collaboration. There's nothing more important than to collaborate with people that, you know, sort of, um, um, if you have certain uh, um, talents and they have certain talents, you know, you just need to mix them up and, and, and build stuff together. And this is what happened with the To Do app, To Do. Um, we had lunch in our co-working space and I started a conversation about To Do apps and I have been trying so many of them. I'm very into like workflow and see how people work and I realized everyone has their own style. And I just realized all the To Do apps out there, they just didn't do it for me. Um, so I started sketching out what I want in a browser, which is basically very list-based and started explaining the whole thing. And my Cameron, who you saw before, the birthday guy, he just laughed and he goes, Tina, for goodness sake, design it, I'll build it for you. I was like, oh, okay. So I sat down, it took me three hours, I gave it to him and literally 24 hours later, we had a working, work, like 
a, um, a prototype up of Todo, and it was working. And we used it in, in our studio, and we just built it for ourselves. Like, again, I just, I wanted to fix my own problems. And <clears throat> everyone that came in saw it and said, like, hey, can I have an account? So we'd be hard coding these things in for a while until I said, come on, Cameron, let's just make a site, and let's just give this away for free. Let's just share this with the world. It's made our work life better. So we did. We made a little site. Cameron made a completely hilarious uh, video explaining what to do is. And the FAQ is even better. So we, again, this was a side project that we didn't take all that serious. We launched it in 2010. And we were so excited people could use this, use this now, right? Because it helped us. So we launched it. I blocked it on Swiss Miss. And for the first time ever in my life, I experienced what some people call the Swiss Miss effect. Um, because the, the sign-ups came into thousands. Like, we were just sitting there hitting refresh going, oh my god, what's happening? We were worried about our servers being able to handle this all, and then we realized that all the big ones, Daring, Fireball, Seth Godin, like, everyone wrote about it. And <laughs> two hours later, a fast company put a blog post up saying it's the most beautiful to-do app of 2010. And we were like, oh, we might be onto something. So we made an iPhone app, which is, has become a small uh, income generator. And we're actually not, right now uh, completely rebuilding the entire app. And it's going to be amazing. We're going to be, be launching it next year. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is like another example of how, how you need to take your side project seriously. And the, if you fix something that is a problem for you, chances are that there's someone else out there who actually would, you know, would enjoy it as well. And we have over 200,000 us 200, users at this point. But just to give you more examples of what came out of our studio space, there's um, the Curator's Cope by Maria Popova. There's um, Quarterly, a subscription to Wonderful Things. There's a book apart. There's Brooklyn Beta, the amazing conference that Cameron and Chris put on. Um, there's Dropmark. There's uh, Frank Kimero's book, and so on. So uh, my, my studio space really is an example for what can happen if you have smart people in one room. And it also brings me to number seven, because a lot of people have called us a very elitist bunch, which brings me to this, ignore haters, because <clears throat> they deserve absolutely none of your time. I, it took me a very long time to get used to this and to come to terms with the fact that they will always be haters. And I learned one thing, that I want to teach my kids to be aware and to distinguish between people that just hate on things and people that um, give uh, well-meaning, well-meant criticism. And you need to distinguish between that. There's people that love to break things and there are people that build things. And you need to know which side you're on and who you're listening to. Um, so I've, I've had to learn that haters are going to hate. <laughs> <clears throat> and again, it took me way into my 30s. And And you really need, I will teach my children that you need to stay away of people that are fond of disliking things. That's a really big role for me. And Chris Shiflett, in his intro to Brooklyn Beta a year ago, had a beautiful way of saying this. He said, um, if you can learn to be a fair judge of yourself, you won't feel to need to rely on other people's opinions. And again, this is really hard, but I, I want to tell all of you, try to get to this point earlier than I did, because you're so much better off. Be a fair judge of yourself. Um, make sure who you listen to, what criticism you listen to, and distinguish between the, the haters that are just hating and the ones that have really good criticism, you know, and they want to help you get better. And so there were, there's a hater that comes out every now and then on my site. And <clears throat> I always had a hard time when this, this crazy troll came out. But now I just realized, you know, I can also monetize the hate. Because the last time he came out and I, I usually pull up this guy, the hater's going to hate guy, I realized, you know, wait a second, we can turn him into a tatly. So now whenever this hater comes up, I just make a follow-up comment. I say, like, yeah, you check this out. So I hope he's going to buy it. <clears throat> um... And this brings me to my last point. Uh, we need to, we owe it, we all owe it to each other to inspire others in whatever way it is. It can be very trivial and just by holding the door open for someone and, and inspire by a little kindness or by, or by somebody starting some, a new product, whatever it is, just always keep in mind you owe it to someone else to inspire the people around you, sort of like my aunt did with me growing up. And in some sense, I always think of myself as a digital aunt hookie. And if I can only inspire people like a, a, 
a fraction of what she did with me, it's all worth it. And at the same time, I realized I really cannot take myself too seriously. <clears throat> so that's it. Thank you so much.